Throughout history, people from different corners of the world have been forced to flee the countries of their birth in search of safety. Safety from persecution, political violence, and armed conflict. Starting in the early 1980s, the Somali Civil War has taken its toll on the country. Just off the coast of Somalia, refugees are streaming across the border into Kenya. Some eventually head to Uganda. This exodus has been going on for over 20 years. The number of displaced persons has swollen to almost a third of the country's entire population. For many of these Somalis, Nachi Valley refugee settlement is now home. Rahma, like many like her, was forced to flee to Uganda. Fifteen years now in this camp, Rahma has gone through terrible things. She left Mogadishu because it had gotten too violent. Unlike many refugee host countries, the 2006 Refugee Act and 2010 Refugee Regulations allow for integration of refugees within the host communities. This means that refugees easily integrate and access the same public services as nationals, a display of exceptional generosity. However, this has had its impact on the existing public resources, especially around the host communities. Uganda hosts refugees displaced by conflicts in the Great Lakes region and the Horn of Africa. As of 31st October 2018, the country was hosting close to 1,200,000 refugees. And with the continued civil unrest in the region, the numbers keep growing. Majority of these refugees come from neighboring countries. The choice of Uganda by refugees has largely arisen from the country's progressive policy and legal framework. A study commissioned by United Nations Development Programme and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and conducted by Legal Aid Service Providers Network to examine the protection needs of refugees and host communities in Isinjiro and Arua reveals glaring gaps in relation to rule of law, access to justice and security. Development responders don't really appreciate the impact the refugee presence has had on the hosting communities. If you go to Isingiro or you go to Arua, you would have to look at the, the population within the district as a whole. I believe anybody doing planning would have to look at that population as a whole and be able to, to plan for them. So that's one thing that this, this, this report is doing, is to, to bring out those gaps in terms of planning. At the global level, we have a community which is anchored on uh, the World Humanitarian Summit, the New York uh, Declaration which emphasizes a need to, you know, to respond better to the needs of refugees, but also to link more strongly the humanitarian and development nexus. We are very glad that we are releasing this report that has information that can be used to respond to the refugee needs, among which are security threats, among which are access to justice needs, but also which impact on the rule of law. Finding sure that both local government and justice law and order sector institutions, which include the Uganda police, Uganda prisons and courts of law, were never adequately prepared for the sudden and drastic increase in the demand of their services. So as refugees have flocked to Uganda, so have the challenges in meeting not just their needs, but also those of the host communities. If these challenges are not addressed, the response could be impeded. We're really excited about the, the, the product and, and, and as a sector it is our primary focus to enhance access to justice for all. We, we deliberately and our current sector strategy have a specific output uh, for, for enhancing access to justice for vulnerable persons and refugees are one of those targeted vulnerable groups in their totality. Despite state structures in place and various institutions mandated to guarantee rule of law, glaring gaps exist. This includes legislative and executive bodies 
as well as judicial institutions. But we don't have a, we don't have a juvenile detention center. Uh, in South Sudan, a girl of 15, they say she's ripe for marriage. Whereas here, Walos and whatnot, they say this is a child. So they really, especially in settlements, it is really very difficult. Bwana ana kazi na wewe bibi hauna kazi mna watoto mna familia hiyo inaweza kuleta pia magomvi mbalimbali ndani ya manyumba lakini na dawa sina pesa kununua na namna kukula hakuna ndio nakuta vita iko mabu nyumba hivyo hivyo wakimbizi hatuna haki sana sana wa mama watoto wengi walisha kufa tuko tunafokea kilo mbili za maharage uzikule mwezi mzima wanakufa kilo 12 za mindu kifimu nakutana ni kilo 10 au ni 11 Unakutana anauzishi la chakula yote anakuya njoo kumoto. Batoto nakutana ni njala biko wanaenda wanaomba omba. Kwa kweli na mwe ni watu. Utaweza kula kilo mbili ya marage mwezi mzima kweli. Police form become a problem. Sometimes you want to go there like you see this one's development. You want to get a exact result through police form. If you reach there they say the form is the only one. If you want to achieve that one, you go and photocopy this. The police have a special unit, the Sex and Gender Based Violence Squad, that deals with SGBV cases. The challenge, though, is that members of this squad have not been given any special training on how to handle these cases. The people we have are these a general detectives, general CID, with no bias in investigating in gender based violence. In our research, we focus so much on women and children, especially children in conflict with the law, but also women that are victims of, uh, victims of SGBV. We make a number of recommendations around that. We also make a number of recommendations around improving the capacity of the jealous institutions, including uh, the courts of law, the police, as special training for the force, uh, some form of uh, training for the judiciary, but also generally legal empowerment for the refugee and host communities. The fourth JLO Sector Development Plan, SDP4, explicitly notes that refugees are a vulnerable constituency that requires targeted access to justice services. In Uganda, like in most countries in the world, we realize through a joint assessment with UNDP with UNHCR, that access to justice is complicated both for host and refugee communities because courts are very far away and the few mobile courts we've been financing are very expensive. So this joint assessment we carried out is just a call to uh, other partners, development partners and others, to support us in improving this access to justice for both the host and refugee communities. But the major problem is to that discrimination of staff and there is no translators. People are required to know exactly the charges that are brought against them and this must be done in the language that they understand. Their problems already started at the police station when they were arrested, during interrogation, writing of the statement. The issue of interpretation. It's, 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 it's a challenge that I think has failed to just go away. You can't get someone who will, who will speak five different languages, you know, in one spot. It's not easy to bail a refugee from court because who's going to stand for them as surety? Uh, so you find that, for example, if it was a, a, uh, a case committed by two people, they give uh, a Ugandan bail and the refugee stays there. Uh, I would uh, propose that uh, in the future we have more awareness for refugee cases. So refugee law and uh, refugee issues should be uh, studied and taught, therefore, in law schools, at the Law Development Center, police training schools. While some judicial officers have experimented with mobile courts, this has not been very successful. This is largely due to logistical deficits as well as lack of planning. The judiciary itself is aware of what needs to be done to ensure success of these courts. You can reduce 
costs of delivering access to justice through mobile courts in the refugee camps by making use of premises for the local administration. At least I've seen where you do initial planning, the outcomes are always much better. It's cheaper, it's more certain, it's more cost effective. The informal justice system stand out as preferred avenues by both host and refugee communities for resolution of legal disputes. They're considered to be less corrupt, less costly, and more accommodative. We pass that now to me to patanisha. We want a police here to an separate jama. Of all the reasons that drive refugees to flee their homes. None is as great as fear. It may be fear of direct physical attack or of a conflict where rape, torture and ethnic cleansing are part of military strategy. Even if they survive these dangers and make it to another country, they may find that their threats and fears follow them. The conflict or tormentors they try to escape from may have an extraterritorial reach and their lives and dignity continue to be threatened. There is a tendency of some elements coming from foreign elements, coming to infiltrate and do havoc to the, to the refugees. They are kidnaps which go on. The camp is open. Anybody can just come in at will, can come in, you know, it's so porous. So I was asking about the increasement of police so that they can put more police for us, so that they can secure us. The security concerns in the settlement and in the host communities are largely social related driven by dire social needs or requirements. There are four situational threats that require attention. These include food insecurity, inter-community hostilities, porous borders and undocumented refugees and land disputes. We also thought that uh, as we deal with the rule of law access to justice and security needs of refugees, we seriously need to look at economic empowerment, livelihood, how do we deal with, uh, with livelihood. That was also a source of tension. But even without that tension, I think uh, the integration program needs to seriously see how to deal with the question of livelihood for, for, for refugees. While refugees and asylum seekers have similar security concerns with Ugandan citizens, they are a more vulnerable group of persons. Yet the security needs of refugees cannot be addressed in isolation of the security needs of the host communities. To address these challenges, a number of measures are required. What would make me feel that the presence of the, of the refugee is a service, is, is not a service, is a service, what would it be? So in the sector of education, for example, if somebody is in a, in a class with a refugee, and I am aware that the structure is a result of having refugees, I think would be addressing the conflicts. The government has got a loan of about 50 million US dollars to improve and also to expand on existing infrastructure in refugee hosting districts to, to build schools, to expand, furnish and equip them, to build new health units, to furnish them, to equip them and also provide with the drugs, and also to establish, open up new roads or upgrade existing roads. This project is one of seven others being implemented in Isinjuru district. Six classrooms are also being constructed on each of the six primary schools in Isinjuru. And the community is just proud, very, very proud of this project. When it is completed, it covers Katembe, Kamuri, eh, Nachivare. In another uh, sense of the broader programmatic uh, of UNDP strategy, we have a governance, a strategy portfolio that involves three areas, rule of law, institutional effectiveness, and also peace and security. And we do hope this study will help not only UNDP and UNHCR, but also the greater community to understand and respond accordingly.